COO of Brown and Bigelow. Uh, he served as senior VP sales and marketing, Cannon Mills, uh, a New York-based uh, bed and bath uh, manufacturer, and worked in marketing management positions as General Foods. Uh, his business career began in the brand management organization of Procter & Gamble. Mr. Sharon is involved in a number of industries and philanthropic activities. He's on the board of the National Retail Federation, where he serves as first vice chairman, also director of Campbell Soup Company, the Partnership for New York City and Vital Voices Global Partnership. In addition, Mr. Sharon is a member of the American Society of Corporate Executives. Raised in Louisville, Kentucky, as a native of Schenectady, New York. Mr. Sharon received his Bachelor of Arts degree from Notre Dame, my favorite college, and holds a master's in business from Harvard. He served five years as a naval officer and is a combat veteran of Vietnam. Mr. Sharon presently resides in Connecticut with a lovely wife and lovely children and his son also is uh, following in his dad's footsteps, graduate of uh, Notre Dame, and uh, he's studying for his MBA at Harvard. And his daughter, Ashley, is in the fashion industry in New York. Is that enough? Mr. Sharon, please get rid of me from here. Take over. Let's see if I can uh, work this uh, fancy stuff. I'm doing okay as long as I don't get too close to that mic. No, don't are get you going to sit down? I'm, I'm are you going to stand sit, up? Or are you standing sit, up? Sit, I am standing oh, okay. up. I need a little stool here oh. to be next to you. Oh, okay. But then no one could measure up to you. No. Well, Alice is, Alice is one of special. my favorite fans, and I'm starting a fan club for retired geezers. And, <laughs> and Alice is going to be the chairman of that. Uh, it seems like I've been here before, and if it does seem that way, it's because I have. I've been coming to FIT for a good many years and talking to Alice's class about pretty much anything uh, you guys and ladies are interested in having me talk about. I love the sound of my own voice, so uh, uh, I'll, I'll take your questions and I'll answer them forthrightly. Uh, I'm not connected with Liz Claiborne in any official capacity. I decided that after 12 years in the corner office, it was time to do something else. And so I advised the board, and well, the board's known since 2003 that I was going to end up in. You see that good hands? Um, that I was going to end up in, um, uh, that I was going to end my career at Liz in, um, at the end of 2006. And that's the way it turned out. Um, um, why did I do it? Uh, because I'm, I'm still relatively young and healthy. I did it for probably two reasons. One, I wanted to do something else uh, without knowing exactly what that was. I want to run another company, or I want to go do private equity, or I want to go into the government. Um, but it was time to leave. Um, Twelve years is a long time. Uh, running a big company. And um, the second reason why I left is because I was kind of tired of all the BS um, and bureaucracy, and I was spending way too much time on that and not enough time on leadership and strategy. And so sometimes what you do is you just kind of get out to get a different perspective. I also believe that it's appropriate, I mean, 10 years is a long time to run a company. And uh, I think it's appropriate for new eyes to look at the challenges of uh, Liz Claiborne, to look at the world in which we live, the competitive environment in which Liz Claiborne operates. And so uh, I was pleased that I left behind a cadre of management that is pretty capable, generally regarded as among the best, if not the best, in the industry. Um, I remember when I came, there were four brands, and one of them was 90% of the total company sales. Uh, that was Liz Claiborne, and 90% of the company's sales were in American department stores. And 12 years later, when I left, there were 43 brands, um, including brands that we built, like Dana Buckman and 
and uh, Crazy Horse and Villager and Liz Claiborne and Claiborne, Dana Buckman, and brands that we bought, like Lucky and Juicy and uh, DKNY that we license and um, lots of interesting brands. The last brand that I bought was uh, Kate Spade, and, and that deal closed in December. So, uh, you know, from 90% of the sales in one brand, 90% of the sales in one channel, a company of $2 billion in revenues. Liz is today a company of $5 billion in revenues, as I say, four to 43 brands, and only 30% of the company's sales are in department stores today, down from 90, and only 20% of the company's sales are Liz Claiborne, down from 90. So the fundamental character of the company changed. What didn't change were, I think, the virtues and values of the company. Those were instilled by the founders, Liz, Art, Leonard, and Jerry, who founded the company in 1976. Liz was a designer. Her husband, Arthur Ortenberg, was an administrator and a very bright guy. Um, Jerry Chazen was a seller par excellence, and Lenny Boxer was a production guy. So you had these people from four disciplines, and they started this company. And they would have been very, very happy if the company had gotten to $10 million in sales. Well, it blew through the $10 million in sales level. And uh, in five years, it was over a billion. It was taken public. Uh, they all became rich and famous. And it's a typical American success story that frequently you do see in the garment industry uh, or certainly in retailing. Um, these entrepreneurs who had a vision Liz's vision, incidentally, was to dress women who were entering the workforce in increasing numbers in the late 1970s. And her vision was to dress women so that they would be treat, treated uh, uh, respectfully uh, and still be able to uh, dress like women. So they dress in a feminine way. You guys and ladies certainly are too young to remember this. but. Uh, the reality is that back in the late 70s, the women were entering the workforce for the first time, and they would dress in kind of manly jackets and ruffled shirts, and sometimes they'd wear kind of a frilly tie of some kind. But it was, it was masculine dressing for women. And Liz built feminine clothing so the woman would be taken seriously, not sexually. And her husband pioneered Far, uh, far Eastern sourcing uh, because he knew that women entering the workforce needed a, a sharp value proposition. So the bottom line is that these people founded the company. They were very philanthropic, as they, particularly as they grew well to do. They had you know, a, a lot of really strong virtues and values. It's always been a, a, a women's place, if you will, a women's company. And I'm proud to say that while I was there, we expanded the responsibilities of many notable women uh, so that about 75% of the key executives, the top executives at Liz Claiborne happened to be female. And the top six officers, uh, when I left, on the front end of the business, all happened to be female. And they were that not because I was trying to create jobs for women, they were that because they were the best qualified executives to take on those jobs. So, you know, I, I changed strategies, I changed I brought a level of professionalism to the company, strategic planning and uh, business measurements and monitors. I focused on interdiscipline, functional uh, interdisciplinary communication so that the finance people would talk to the, to the manufacturing people who would talk to the marketing people who would talk to the design people, to the merchandise people. I believe that too frequently executives are stuck in functional silos that is, merchants keep going up the merchant ladder and work, 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 constantly working for merchants. And salespeople grow up the sales ladder, and design people grow up the design ladder, and finance people go up this ladder, and manufacturing people. And the real way you make money in business, since I assume that not too many of you guys and ladies are just looking to do artist pieces for the Smithsonian or the Costume Institute, I think you probably want to make a living um, and you'd be amazed at all the, quote, designers, unquote, who don't make a living, i.e., they're big names. I can name them, but I would be, it would be rude, who have notoriety, artistic notoriety. They don't make any money. They lose money. And they're like starving artists. They might as well be singing while they're waiting table at some bar 
or decent restaurant in, in New York. I'm not deprecating that, but if your interest is in making money and, 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 and making a better life for yourself, then you gotta get a job that pays. And to get a job that pays and to be successful in that job, it seems to me that you have to understand how you make money in a fashion organization and how you fail to make money. And generally, nine times out of 10, it's not the quality of the design that is the driver of that. The quality of the design is a major contributor. Sometimes it's the only thing. That's the one time out of 10. But the real way you make money and the real way you fail to make money is the, in the quality of communications within the organization. So one of the encouragements I would give you is not to be one dimensional, but to see this as a business because that's what it is. It has artistic elements and artists can survive in this business as long as they understand that it is a business. It is not a pure art form. There are elements of artistry that you put to work every day. Many of you are designers, many of you are merchants. That's the artistic side. But you have to be business people as well, which means you have to use both sides of your brain, the emotional side and the intellectual side, the logical side, okay, and the thoughtful side. You have to do that. And the way you do that is you grow in an organization is to understand what the guy, when you think about, when you think about the creation of product, think with me for a moment about a value chain. A value chain is a series of connections. It's like a subway line with a series of stops. And at each stop, some value is added to the product. So the designer comes up, maybe a merchant comes up with a concept. A designer designs to the concept. A merchant then assorts it. A manufacturing person builds a sample. A merchant and a designer approve the sample. A finance person costs the line. It goes back to a sales per it goes to a salesperson who sells the line. Okay. The merchant then comes back and rebalances so your supply and demand is appropriate. It's balanced. You're not making too much. You're not making more than you can profitably sell. And you're not leaving too much on the table. And then, you know, your production people build it. And your shipping people, your logistics people, get it from here to there. Your retail people present it. Your visual merchandising people show it off. Your business analysis people study what happened so that you can learn from this experience the next time you do it. And that's an awful long subway line. What it is like is it's like a series of, it's like a relay with a series of baton passes. If you're just a designer and you only understand design and you don't understand what happens when you take the baton from whoever handed it to you, and you don't understand what the next person is going to do with it when you pass it to that next person, even if it's going to ultimately come back to you, I would argue that, that those are the interfaces where you make money or you fail to make money. And that's the essence of this business. Um, a lot of the businesses, a lot of the artistic people that you see, famous names are not commercially viable. You, I, I, I know of 80 and 100 million dollar businesses in this industry run by designers that you would know of that lose money. How in the hell can you lose money when you got 100 million dollars in sales? The answer is a lack of discipline. No calendar line adherence. You, know, you can't just say, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do what I want when I want to do it. I'm going to come up and if, I, and if I change my mind, then I'm going to change my mind. Well, you can't do that and expect to make money. Every time you change your mind, and you, even if you're trying to take something and make it better. Now, if something's really lousy and you change your mind and say, I'm not going to produce it, that's okay. But a lot of times designers and, and artists, if you will, change their mind and, and they try to make something better by 1%. They try to take it from 97% of perfection to 98% of perfection. Trust me. The consumer isn't going to know the difference between 97 and 98. She'll know the difference between 97% of perfection and 50% of perfection. She's not going to know the difference between 97 and 98. That's why disciplines like calendar line discipline 
and margin goals are really important. Nobody wants to work for nothing. So those of you who are designers need to understand that for you to get paid for your good idea, there need to be a series of disciplines. And my counsel to you is that each of you guys and ladies think, you absorb, you process, and you be curious about what happens in the whole business of fashion. The business of fashion is fascinating. The art is fascinating too, but the business of fashion gives some guys like me the opportunities to do very interesting things. Now, as you can tell from Alice's uh, glorious introduction, um, I've had lots of jobs. In fact, there are some who have suggested that I can't hold a job. My wife has suggested that to me from time to time. Um, I just have enjoyed moving from place to place. I enjoy the challenges of learning about new things. Um, and I didn't come to this industry until I was 45 years old. I'd never had a job in the fashion business. But interestingly enough, I never had a business course until I was 26, 27 years old. My undergraduate degree is political theory and English literature. And I spent five years in the Navy, as Alice suggested, in communications, electronics, and cryptography, codes and ciphers. Sounds pretty weird, but it was a lot of fun. I got to travel around the world. I'd been around the world a couple of times by the time I was 25 years old. And I was always touched by the different people, the different cultures, the different places. I still travel extensively. I don't even know how many countries I've been in, but last month I was in California, which I realize isn't another country. Uh, I know, that was a trick. I was in California, Australia, Holland, and Hong Kong just last month. I was in the United States for five days. Now, that was a little unusual. I'm not going to do that every month because that's just, that's just too tough. Um, but I, I, I came to this industry with a very interesting and an eclectic background. And uh, I was, had the good fortune of being able to get people to teach me all about the industry. And over time, I think we did some really good things at, uh, at Liz Claiborne and built a great company that uh, I think has a solid foundation um, uh, going forward. So my interest is in being helpful to you uh, men and women. And so I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to stop here and I'm going to uh, see what sort of questions you guys have or what sort of things you'd like me to talk about. Uh, the story of Liz Claiborne is pretty straightforward. As, you know, I told you the early history. Uh, when I got there, you know, the sales were down. Um, morale sucked. The company stock price was down. I, I mean, it wasn't like we were failing. We were still making money. It's just that we weren't going anywhere. And so I, I was up to me to kind of challenge some of the hypotheses that had gotten and assumptions that had gotten the company to where it was. It was a $2 billion company, which is better than chopped liver, but it, you know, it wasn't going anywhere. And so now, as I say, it's, it's considerably larger. It's a fundamentally different place, although the virtues and values, as I've suggested, are, are the same. But you know, we did a lot of things. We did acquisitions. We did licenses. We invested in information technology. I hired a lot of people. I fired a lot of people. I cut costs. I spent money. I invested in marketing. I did a lot of things that, that, and most of them, knock on wood, most of them turned out to be pretty positive. So as you guys think about starting out, um, what to, what can I say that would be most helpful to you or most enlightening that would be uh, stimulating to you, make you think? Maybe think about old things in new ways. Yes, ma'am. In your opinion, what is the most what? The most what? Challenging. Oh, yeah, no, I'll repeat it. What's the most challenging thing about working in the fashion industry? Um, I think, honestly, the most challenging thing about working in the fashion industry is it's got a lot of undisciplined people. Um, that's not a good thing. Undisciplined people. I didn't, not all creative people need to be undisciplined. Your creativity needs to take place, I think, within a context. For example, if, if you're in your car in New York City 
and you want to go to Los Angeles, you know, you should know that you need to head west. If you find yourself on I-95 going eastbound, that's not good. You, it could be expre expressive, but it doesn't make sense to go east if you want to go west. Um, you don't have to necessarily say, well, I'm going to go to Los Angeles. You can start out and get to Kansas City, and you can decide to go to, well, maybe I'll go to Portland, maybe I'll go to San Francisco, maybe I'll go to Los Angeles. Though, but you need to know that you're going to go west. So what you do needs to be undertaken in some kind of strategic context. There has to be a master plan. And you young people need master plans about your career. You may all think that you're going to go, go to work and you're going to be the next, the greatest thing since sliced bread. And I'm not going to disabuse any of you from that notion. But you should be thinking, okay, if that doesn't work out or if I run out of money, what am I going to be doing? What skills will I acquire? When you look, when you listen to a job offer or something like that, what skills am I going to acquire at this company? And where is this going to put me two years down the road? A lot of people don't have a plan. And that's an example of people who lack discipline. And there's nothing that wrecks havoc on an organization more than a bunch of undisciplined people who are doing whatever the hell they feel like doing under the guise of creativity. You don't find a lack of discipline in the finance function. You generally don't find much creativity in the finance function either, but since we're not interested in creative accounting, that's not necessarily a bad thing. But I would say that one of the challenges is, a, is a, a, an overabundance of, of undisciplined people. Um, uh, I found the fashion industry just fascinating, intellectually and emotionally fascinating. I guess it should be intellectually fascinating and emotionally stimulating. Lots of really neat people, lots of wild and crazy people, lots of fun people, lots of expressive people, lots of very passionate people. So I, I, I thought I, my time in the fashion industry, I mean, I'm, I'm obviously going to go back to work. My wife is, you know, I may be retired, but I'm not going to go play golf. I mean, I'm going to work. I just don't know what I'm going to do. My wife told me, she said, I married you. My, I've had the same wife for 30, uh, 33 years. I know, I know, I know. June 29th, 1974. Um, so I've had the same wife for 33 years. And she told me she married me for better, for worse. She didn't marry me for lunch. So uh, she says, get the hell out of the house. You're on my space. So I come to New York City and I sit in the Empire State Building couple of days a week. But, you know, I'm going to get a, like a real job. Uh, but I just don't know what I'm going to do. You know, maybe I'll go back and run another company or maybe I'll go do private equity and buy companies and stuff like that. Or maybe I'll go do government. I'm not really sure. Um, but, but I'm not going to, it's unlikely if I go to work, work as opposed to the government, that I'm going to be outside the fashion industry. I, I like the fashion industry. It gets into your skin. And I was fortunate, interestingly enough, I think I was especially fortunate that I started out at a relatively advanced age with another, with a, a bunch of different observations and different experiences. Um, and I've been able to get people to teach me, which I think is a skill, to get people. You walk in and you're like a big cheese and you're not a jerk but you're interested in what people say. Now, why do you feel that way? What about this? What about that? And then what happens is that they're teaching you what they do. Well, what's wrong? What's the company doing really well? What's the company doing poorly? What's the competition doing better? And you're not defensive about it. Well, what, what, what do you mean? Tommy Hilfiger is doing something better than Liz Claiborne? Are you disloyal? No. You're objective. You're objective. You have to be objective to be an executive. So um, I'll talk to you about mostly the things that I like about the industry. Uh, and I encourage you, I mean, this is a great industry, but you need to continue to grow as individuals and you're not going to get, you're not going to get as much, do not rely on the company you go with to teach you. Here, I'm going to create, there's nobody from the press here, is, is there? If there is anybody from the press, this is all off the record. Um, I posture that very few companies that you'll go to will put you in a development program where you will say, uh, you'll have a series of steps that you'll take so you'll be at, if you start out of position A, you'll be at position C in some linear way two years down the road. 
This industry, by and large, doesn't develop people. Other industries do. I had great training. Great training at several companies. Procter & Gamble, for start. I, I have a reflexive competency in marketing. And I'm a strategist. Where did I learn that? Well, I think I learned most of it at P&G. But I was there seven and a half years. So I wasn't once, and I wasn't there and gone. Like, I got the lobotomy. I got whatever it was they were trying to teach. So I think it's very important that you not abrogate your responsibility for your own development. For your own development. You have to be responsible for your own development. And you have to say, excuse me, this is where I want to be. Excuse me, this is what I want to be exposed to. Don't just say, oh, thank you so much. Thank you. I'll sit in this chair. I won't say anything. You know, your board's stiff. You sit around with time on your hands in the afternoon. I mean, that's not good. Time is your, is, it, if you waste it, time is, time is an enemy. If you take advantage of it, it's an asset. So I would encourage you to go to somebody, go to a place to work where they care about you and they're committed to your development. But I wouldn't take your own development for granted. I wouldn't assume that you're going to be developed if you get with XYZ company or ABC company. Well, they're going to they're gonna train and develop me. You need to reach out. You need to come back. You need to go to seminars. You need to read Women's Wear Daily. You need to read DNR. You need to read the Wall Street Journal. You re need to read Forbes and Fortune magazine. You say, man, what am I going to need that for? It's going to teach you. You don't know how much of that stuff that you read is going to stick to the inside of your noggin. It will give you a broader perspective as opposed to a simple, linear, one-dimensional perspective. Companies want people with broad perspective. They do not want one-dimensional thinkers. Long-winded answer to a good question. What other questions do you guys have? Yes, ma'am. Okay, you're going, to have to, you're going to have to speak up for me because I used to be able to hear well, but I slept under a gun mount for eight months and a gun went off every five seconds. Did you know that you can go to sleep between the, when the gun goes blam, you can go to sleep? Well, you don't care. Um, <laughs> what private activities are interested in action seems to be a hot topic right now? Yeah. Relationship and then also, what are you doing to help the company that you How important is, is it, those are two good questions. How important it is, is it to get an MBA? And um, what about private equity? Um, and, why, private, why is private equity interested in fashion? Um, private equity is interested in everything. Like a lot of things in the stock market, you've got all these big funds. They have lots of, lots of money. And the people that are investing in these funds don't give the money to the funds for it to sit in the bank account. These guys need to invest. And they're running around looking to buy undervalued assets. And the reality is that big companies in the fashion business, like Liz Claiborne, VF, and Jones Apparel, just to name three, are relatively well-valued, i.e. they're cheap relative to the expenditures or investments that, that private equity could make in other industries. It would take $6 billion, $5 billion, $10 billion, whatever. It doesn't matter. From a relative earnings point of view, those are all highly profitable companies. And I'm not suggesting that any of these companies can be taken out by a private equity player. But you're asking me, why is that interesting? They can put a lot of money to work against a pretty consistent uh, return on, uh, on their investment. They can load these companies up with debt because none of those companies have much debt. The companies, Liz, Jones, VF, all have about 20% debt. These guys will take it up to 60% debt, 70% debt. There's a lot of free money or relatively free money around because interest rates are very low. So they can borrow cheap money uh, using the, leveraging the assets of the company. They can pay themselves egregious amounts of money. They can invest in the company, and they can pump it up, and then they can spin it in three years and turn a profit. Now, I've oversimplified it, but I would tell you that the reason why uh, private equity is interested in fashion is because of the values that exist in fashion right now. Another uh, reason is because of the real estate values of some of the retail companies. Um, Lord & Taylor is an example. 
Lord and Taylor owns this property on, B30, on Fifth Avenue between 38th and 39th. They also own the air rights to that, which is everything above that. So you could see a store that they could do, and then above the store they build a whole bunch of apartments or whatever, condominiums on Fifth Avenue at 38th, 39th, that wouldn't be a bad address. They rent them out, they sell them for a gazillion dollars, and they turn an underperforming asset into a performing asset. And the store, Lord & Taylor, is almost incidental. The value may very well be in the real estate. People that don't own real estate, retailers that only rent real estate, are less attractive. In the case that I mentioned, Lord & Taylor uh, owned the real estate. A uh, young woman asked a question about the value of an MBA. Um, I think that it's of questionable value. I'm going to go out on a limb here. I believe strongly in the value of an MBA. For me, I needed an MBA because I'd never had a business course, as I said. Uh, if you got an undergraduate business degree, then maybe an MBA is of less value. I think the MBAs that are most valuable, frankly, are the ones from the really good schools. That's Harvard, Stanford, Michigan, uh, places like that. And these are very expensive. I'm paying tuition bills at Harvard. And it's $40,000 a year just for tuition. It doesn't count room and board. Okay, so you think another uh, $2,500 a month. Uh, and you got to do that for 12 months, so that's another $25,000 a year. Okay, $30,000 a year, so that's 30 on top of 40. And then you got to assume that, that you have a job. I mean, and you're going to have to give up that job to go full-time to Harvard or wherever. And, and let's say you're making $60,000. Okay, so you add that on, and you're up to a rather substantial $60,000 a year, and it's a two-year program. So you're talking 40, 37, you're up to $130,000 in one year. So you're talking about an investment of $260,000. And oh, by the way, that's after tax, because you have to, you know, no, the paying for it, the paying for it, the $40,000, I mean, you can take out loans, but geez, Luis, you guys want to be coming out of school with all sorts of loans, I mean, you want to have a quarter of a million dollars that you have to spend. So, I mean, I think you can recoup that over a career if you can get scholarships, but recouping that is, is of greatest value. The likelihood that you'll recoup that is of greatest value in the really, really good schools. And I'd encourage anybody who can go to any of those schools, top 20 schools, MBA program, if you can go, I would scrape and I'd do it. Okay? I think it's important that you understand business, but I don't think that to understand business you have to have an MBA. I think a few night courses or an MBA that takes you seven years to get at night and on Saturdays is, may not be worth, the pain may not be worth the gain. It screws up your life. I mean, you're, you're going from work to class. I mean, it, you're, just, you're just exhausting yourself for seven years. My preference is, if you can, to, to, to go to school. Go to school, full time, get it over with, if you really think it's of value. But, I, I mean, it's, you could say that it's increasingly important. It's more important, or it's of greater value in the industry today than it was 30 years ago. But I, I wouldn't lose any sleep over it. If it's something you really want to do, then by God, I'd, I'd do it. I mean, it's kind of follow your passion. And if you're, if, you're, if you're not a very good student or you don't like to spend your time doing that kind of stuff, don't bother. But if you are a good student, if you're academically rigorous, then hell, go for it. Go for it. Why not? And, and, and I would even say go for it if you could incur manageable debt. I went to grad school back in the, age, in, the, in, in the Middle Ages, and, and, and I, had, I had people that paid for my graduate school. They paid for my undergraduate school. I had a scholarship to college, so I didn't pay to go to Notre Dame, which was really cool because I have five younger brothers, and my, I don't come from a well-to-do family. And then I had the military pay for my, uh, for my graduate school, so I got out of Harvard with like $5,000 in debt. 
which I paid off like immediately. My first job was $15,000. I thought I was rich. <laughs> and you know what? I was. I was. Now I make a lot more than $15,000, and there are days when I don't feel nearly as rich. Um, what other questions do you guys have? I don't have a, a watch on. Somebody have the time? Because Alice has told me I have to, I can't, I have to stop talking at 545. No. <laughs> gotcha. Oh, 445, I gotcha. Uh, so it's 430? 448. It's 448. So I got like 12 more minutes, right, Alice? Good. Okay, good. Um, what other questions do you have? 12 minutes. 12 minutes. That's all they want. You guys want to go out. I'm, I'm sitting between you guys and your homework or a couple of drinks. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> Well, I made a lot of mistakes. Um, but I remember my successes. I don't remember my mistakes. I mean, you go to the plate and you swing a bat, to use a, a typical guy uh, analogy, and sometimes you're going to whiff. You're going to strike and miss. I mean, I put wrong people in, the, in, in places. Uh, I've never fired anybody prematurely. You understand what I'm saying? I've never fired somebody too early. I've always waited and given them the benefit of the doubt, and I every single time should have done it earlier. Um, I, I, I really like the, the companies I bought. Um, um, I wouldn't change them. I mean, some of them are less successful and others are more successful, but, but you've got to do what you've got to do. Um, honestly, I'm not the kind of person that dwells on um, failure and I can't remember anything like really bad. I can, I can remember a story from, from my days at Procter & Gamble where I was so infatuated by hockey that I, I put a premium together for Joy dishwashing detergent in the yellow bottle. And um, you buy a bottle of Joy, 12 ounces, and with it you get a Victoriaville hockey stick signed by, I don't know, Guy Lafleur, I don't know, somebody. And I thought this was incredible because I had come out of Boston. I was really a fan of the Boston Bruins, and it, it was like great. It was like awesome. Well, I forgot that people in Memphis, Tennessee, didn't have ice. They have a lot of hockey sticks in a warehouse in Memphis today that uh, are courtesy of yours truly because I bought them and I shipped them there, but somehow the hockey sticks didn't move. Uh, so you got mistakes that you make like that, but I haven't. One of the things about Liz is I didn't make any really terrible mistakes. Um, I, I didn't bet the ranch. I didn't take undue chances. Nowadays, what you really have to be careful about are all the ethical things that you can get crosswise on. You know, there's, this industry is fraught with dishonest people. There are plenty of opportunities to cheat to cut corners, and I'm telling you, don't do it. Don't do it. Don't even think about doing it. The penalty is too great. And the greatest thing you have is your own reputation and your own integrity. If you've got to cheat to win, then lose. It's better to lose than to cheat to win. And uh, I'm, I feel especially fortunate that I was able to leave Liz walking as opposed to being carried out or thrown out. I feel especially good that I left Liz with my reputation intact, a better reputation than when I went in. And I was really grateful that I didn't get anybody in my company on my watch caught cheating and doing kickbacks in Asia and stuff like that, which is, I mean, it, it happens. It happens. And that's why whenever I go to Asia, I talk about respectful working conditions. And you can't abuse people. You can't discriminate against people. You can't cheat. You know, no kickbacks. I'll deal harshly with this. You know, you know, you, you talk to some of those people, and that's like a foreign language over there. They're happy to do that stuff. They're happy to do whatever the hell they need to do to get the order. But there are ways you run a business, and there are ways you don't run a business, and you don't cross the line. Yes, sir. Or ma'am. I'm sorry. Yes. Right here. Yes. Now that you turn around and see the ponytail. Yes, ma'am. 
You're welcome. It doesn't sound weird to me. So how do you keep a balance between um, the softer side of a company, the artistic side, and the harder side of the company, which is the pragmatic and the business, and the business side? Um, I think it's, it's mutual respect and it's recognition that we are mutually interdependent. My success depends on your ability, since this is a team sport, this is not an individual sport, this is not golf. Okay, you watch these guys in the Masters. My wife was looking, she said, what a lonely sport. You walk up and down the fairway by yourself, you go out on the practice greens and fairways by yourself. I mean, if you wanna do that, go for it. But if you're in this business, this is a team sport. And team